So let me ask General Hasnan that question. From a military perspective, you know, our producers have compiled just some basic data of uh, the Iranian armed forces versus the Israeli armed forces. Given the practical contemporary reality, how, if God forbid it ever were to come to that, how do you see this battle go? Iran versus Israel? Um, I'm not sure I've got your question entirely right. But uh, yes, on a, on a ratio proportion method or just the uh, numerical um, numbers which are available out of the two together, it really makes no sense uh, whether a competitive kind of a war between the two of them, what will it result in? At the end of the day, I think it's all going to end in a, in a stalemate. Uh, no ground movement. I don't expect any kind of a ground movement. But a escalation in the proxies war. Definitely an escalation in the proxies war. The use of Hezbollah, the support to Hezbollah. You remember that uh, the supply lines from Iran to Hezbollah are open at all times, unlike the case of Hamas. So it is Hezbollah which will play the major role in case this has to come to an escalation between Iran and, and Israel. Gaurav, you want to share with our viewers your sense of God forbid if it ever were to come down to an Iran versus Israel war, how is that likely to go? So Iran will use the Hezbollah and that's why Israel is already bombing uh, the Syrian airfields at Aleppo uh, and in Damascus to ensure that Hezbollah supply line is interdicted and it's not a continuous supply line. Uh, they're trying to ensure Hezbollah doesn't get uh, all the weapons. Hezbollah is also not escalated beyond a point. So everyone's calibrating uh, uh, their response. Hezbollah is targeting the Sheba farms area or uh, some of those watchtowers or, or tanks. Uh. But Hezbollah can't have a situation where Hamas becomes the Palestinian hero. So at some point in time, they will, and we've seen that with Tanzim in uh, Jammu and Kashmir as well, if one gets super active and is uh, staging big operations, the other also feels the urge to do something spectacular. True. So uh, that is why they'll calibrate. Hamas, as far as Israel is concerned, since it's an existential war and from a young corporal to their army chief to their prime minister, Everyone saying we have to decimate Hamas uh, to ensure it doesn't remain a ruling entity uh, at the Gaza Strip or even as a terror entity. Their initial target, that aerial bombing, is to destroy all the tunnels, the maze of this apparently 500 kilometers of tunnel, 1300 odd tunnels. They want to destroy it uh, at to the best of their ability, but they want to get their hostages back. Phase one. Phase two is through Mossad, try and take out the leadership, whether it's in Qatar or in other places. Hamas doesn't remain, so that Hamas doesn't remain an entity. Is Iran, according to Israel, is their biggest threat. They're saying you have to cut off the head of that snake and the head of the snake is Iran. How they intend to go about it, uh, from what I've been able to gather, their limited objective is, is Hamas. Their wider objective would be Iran. But America says, hold your horses. Let's, let's at least uh, ensure that Hamas is decimated and the civilian casualty does not escalate. So as of now, I think this battle will remain there, containing operations on the western front, with uh, the northern front with Hezbollah and massive operations in the south, quite like our 1971, if I may, holding operations in the west, big operations in the east. Okay, let's go across to Simcha Ratman, chair of the Nesset Constitution Law and Justice Committee. Uh, Mr. Ratman, I want to ask you about uh, Israel's impending offensive in the Gaza Strip. We're hearing from Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu who said once again that an offensive is coming. It's been a long time coming, hasn't started yet. How do you see this operation in Gaza proceed and what do you militarily think would be the end objective once the once the IDF gets into Gaza? So the military objective um, has to be the same, doesn't matter when uh, the army will get in on the ground. The military objective must be the, the militarization of the Gaza Strip. We cannot accept any weapon in the Gaza Strip. We must have it. Uh, all the threats over our people be eliminated because we know, we all saw what's happening when we have this kind of threats. Uh, um, it, it does not stay as a threat. We saw we saw the murder, we saw the rape, we saw the burn, the, the fire, we saw everything. So we cannot accept any uh, weapons in Gaza Strip, strip uh, uh, aimed at our people. And that's the military objective. It's the you know, um, destruction of all the abilities of Hamas, uh, the army abilities, the, uh, gov the gover governance, everything. 
must be annihilated for, again, for the same simple reason, because we must uh, exist in this area and we cannot exist with this kind of threat over our body. Now, of course, when, um, uh, when and where um, the army will attack, it's something that I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, responsible of. It's, it's for, the, for the security cabinet and the army to, to, be, uh, to be on this issue. And of course, I'm not going to dis discuss this, uh, those issues. You know, the, the other question that's being asked again and again in strategic circles worldwide is about the end game in Gaza. Uh, at some point in time, over the next several weeks, as the IDF goes in, they will be able to militarily establish control over Gaza. But last time, uh, the Israelis chose to come out because they didn't want to govern Gaza. So politically, in your view, who administers Gaza once you've gone in and taken down the military capabilities of the Hamas? Um. Uh, this issue, I think, is not an issue we should uh, discuss now. No one ever, no, not a single soldier who came to, to fight uh, Nazi Germany from all countries of the world that went and fought this fight, um, no one held a map of what, will, what exactly will be the border, what will happen with Berlin, what will be with the Marshall Program, or, or any other um, arrangements that came after the war. In the war, there is a clear objective to defeat the enemy. That's the objective. What's happening after, we'll have all the time in the world to discuss once Aza is uh, demilitarized and there is no threat. You know, there have been reports in Israel that 100,000 Israeli citizens have applied for a gun license in just the last week. How do you assess this urge amongst Israeli citizens to take security in their own hands and not be dependent on the security forces for their security? They don't want to be taking any more chances. So, of course, uh, of course, events like we saw um, on, on October 7th disrupt the basic security feeling and, and the, the, the security of the communities in Israel, all around, in the cities, in the in the rural areas, um, we all know what happened. And uh, so many, many people naturally want to have the ability to defend themselves. Also before those events, many lethal attacks by terrorists were prevented or um, were stopped in the middle by civilians having their own guns with gun permits. So it's uh, gun permits in this neighborhood of the world saves lives. So, uh, of course, naturally, a lot of people in Israel ask for it. I have to say, I dealt with this issue um, for a few years, and we were asking also for from uh, a former government to expand the, the, the scope of the people that are eligible to carry a uh, gun. And, and this is, of course, the, it's, it came now better late than ever, and we see the numbers spike. You know, and 